Let's uh, bring in Dalip Singh, Chief Global Economist and Head of Global Macroeconomic Research uh, at PGIM Fixed Income. He's also a former Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics uh, in the Biden uh, administration. And, and I've asked a few people, uh, Dalip, about, you know, expectations for yesterday and what actually, uh, what actually happened. And I, I, like everything, we go on, on, from one to 10, how was it? What, what would you, I, I said it's like a six and a half, seven or, or, or better for you? I don't know about the number, Joe. And look, I know people brush it off, but nobody should discount the importance of talking in a difficult relationship. I mean, let's not forget, a Chinese destroyer came within 150 yards of an American warship this summer. Chinese fighter jets have been buzzing within 20 feet of American pilots. So guardrails are good. It's what responsible countries do. But everybody knows that talking alone doesn't fix a broken relationship. And that's that's what we're left with. I mean, President Xi incorrectly believes the U.S. is in structural decline and that we're aiming to suppress China's ascendance. And that really triggers China's sense of aggrievement. It harkens back to the century of humiliation. And the U.S., you know, for its part, uh, we see President Xi is doubling down on suppression at home and aggression abroad. And we've stopped pretending there's any real hope of inducing China to converge towards our economic and political model. So, look, this is going to produce a honeymoon. Um, I think the honeymoon is going to be measured in weeks. And uh, perhaps as soon as the Taiwan elections next January, the gloves may be off again. Well, you don't need to give it a number. You just gave it a two. Oh, you, you didn't need to say it, but uh, that didn't sound good. No, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> didn't sound good at all. I, I, so we're I, talking again. But it, it, is there not going to be a military base near Cuba? Is there, there going to be no more spy balloons? There's going to be no more uh, whatever any of the aggressive moves in the South China Sea. None of the, is all well, that going to. We've Joe, got, do if, we get played, Dilip? We got played those, again. If those were your expectations going in, then there's a disappointment. But I think any realistic person never thought we were going to solve those problems in, in one conversation over he the course of He got a standing of ovation. He got a standing ovation from the CEOs. There was glad, and we looked like we were best friends. Are we getting played, Dilip? And are, Look, are we, I, is, it, is it a, you know, we're lulled into this, you know. It depends uh, who you mean, mean by we. I do think, I do think certain American CEOs, their, their particular corporate interests, they're not aligned with our national interests. The truth is China has not been playing by the same rules as us. That's caused serious harm to trade-affected communities. It's caused real damage to our political economy. China is trying to narrow our, our technological preeminence. They're challenging us in the Indo-Pacific. And I think what you're, what you're hearing from the U.S. is um, we're happy to engage in this competition. We like our chances. We're going to bring our friends with us. And if China doesn't insist, if China does not play by the same rules, we'll include um, some protectionist measures as well to ensure that it's a fair fight. So that's not getting played. That's that's looking clear-eyed at a competition that's going to be very difficult. So the, the planet's a big place, and it's definitely big enough for both of us to coexist in, in beautiful harmony. Do you, do you take him at his word I don't, for that? I wouldn't use those words. I, I would say we're going no, to be they, in a— But he used those words. Should we take him at his word, or do they still want to eventually supplant us as, as in the world order? I, I, I think I think it's clear from President Xi's words that he sees it's now time. It, he's, he's done away with the Deng Xiaoping mantra that we're going to hide our strengths and bide our time. I think President Xi believes that China's rightful ascendance is now before us, um, and he wants to exercise global hegemonic supremacy primarily through economic and technological means. And he's he's playing by a different set of rules than we are. And that's why this is going to be, a, at times, a very confrontational relationship. But the point of this meeting was, let's make sure that this competition and this confrontation at times doesn't go off the rails, because we have a responsibility to our people and to people all over the world to ensure that we at least talk to each other uh, and prevent accidents, prevent miscalculations. When you have this kind of potential kinetic conflict in the South China Sea, um, that is that is worthy of having uh, a, a way to mitigate those risks, to manage potential crisis. So it's what if, a responsible country does. If we are on the cusp of a, at least a, I don't know, months or years of, of easing tensions, is it due to China's uh, 
or President Xi's problems with the economy and with the real estate market, whatever you want to talk about, that, that makes China less formidable than it was? Is it, would, it, would, would, it, would it have happened if they had the growth that, that they were putting up from five years ago? Yeah, I think President Xi needed this meeting uh, because of some of the some of the problems that you're referencing. They're dealing with a real demographic collapse. They're still deleveraging from their credit binge uh, back in 2010. And de-risking is starting to eat away at their export market share. Um, you know the youth unemployment numbers in China, the risk to social stability are real. So I think China, for its own reasons, needed to uh, needed to calm down the tensions and have, have a circuit breaker. But I don't think that's gonna be measured in, I think you mentioned months or years. I, I really do think, depending on the outcome of the Taiwanese election, we could be set for another round of escalation soon thereafter and, and through the U.S. elections next November. Do you have a high degree of confidence in, in President Biden and his administration to uh, impress upon China that, that they'll only accept so much in these things? Or do you uh, agree with some of the criticism that, that we're, you know, probably way too... Uh, I don't know, that we were, like I said earlier, that, that we were actually played and that, that we're not taking a tough enough stance, not even close to a tough enough stance uh, uh, I, as far as pushing back. Joe, I think the administration's doing the right thing. The diagnosis that was reached by the previous administration was correct, that China is not playing by the same rules and that they are seeking a form of hegemony, at least in the region, maybe more broadly, but they were not taking a strategic approach. I mean, the crown jewel of our economy is technology. And we've now we've now added to. I mean, the trade restrictions have been kept in place, but now uh, there's a I think a much more strategic posture of saying what are the foundational technologies that give us long-term economic growth, and that advance our national security objectives. Around those technologies, there's going to be a higher fence, and if capital travels with that technology, like FDI, that also needs to be screened. So you you saw in the last quarter, for the first time in China's history, negative FDI inflows. So, you know, the, the business sector, the private sector is, is paying attention to what's happening in Washington. And I think we're on the right path uh, to confronting this challenge.